Uh, today, our session would be basically about um, studying together about um, unreserved yieldedness. Okay, can I just check with y'all, when you say unreserved yieldedness, before I start, is there anyone you want to share what is unreserved yieldedness to you? It can be anybody. Yeah. Well, for me, I'll go ahead and share something, if that's okay, Veronica. Yeah, maybe um, you want to just introduce yourself, Claire? Oh, sure. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Claire. I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, and the States, and it's currently evening for us, so you guys are a day ahead of us. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I'm a friend of Veronica's, and she told me about this wonderful project that she's doing, and I wanted to be a part of it. So um, for me, I think unreserved yieldedness, when I think of those two words, I thought of them originally as separate, but then coming together, they have a whole new meaning. So unreserved always means, I guess, um, without hesitation or with no, um, no, no limits. And then yield, yieldedness, um, I think of obedience. So putting those two things together may, um, made me think of obedience with, com with completion, obedience without limits um, to God, that is. Um, so that's, that's what it made me think of. Thank you, Claire. Okay, uh, as I said, this one is not just, uh, this session is not basically about just, uh, I, I speak all the time. And if you do have something in between you want to share, you will be able to, as I said, this is more of a teaching um, a session uh, rather than just a preaching session. Preaching is like, um, you know, I speak and everybody listen, but this is more of a teaching. So it's a bit of a different context. Okay, so you're welcome to just, um, you know, pause and just share if there's something you want to share. Okay, so unreserved yieldedness. Uh, before we go to unreserved yieldedness, uh, I just want to uh, make, have a moment for you all to think, what does uh, reserve means to you? You know, when we look at someone, we usually say that, uh, um, you know, this person is reserved or, you know, or is uh, this uh, particular conversation is reserved for this group of people. That is what we usually have heard. So in your definition, what is reserved? Uh, Claire did say that is um, um, something about being unreserved. But here I'm actually posing an, another question. What is reserved? Before we, we move into unreserved, I just wanted to unpack what is reserved to you? Anyone? There's no right or wrong answer. So, and all of us are together here. So we are learning together. So what does reserve mean to you? Anybody? It, it can be even in Tamil, if you're more comfortable in Tamil or in, in any other language. Okay. Veronica. Yep. I give you a, okay. So I know when we say a person is reserved, we think of the person being very quiet. But you know, there's another meaning to the word reserved, which, you know, you reserve the seat or you mm -hmm. reserve a product. Mm -hmm. So a reserve could also mean like, in a way, set apart. Yes, thanks. Okay, she's Chitrani, uh, and one of my friends also, she's from Singapore. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Chitrani. Okay, well said. So when I looked at the dictionary, uh, when I was actually uh, studying about this unreserved yieldedness, uh, firstly, the first question I believe the Holy Spirit posed to me was, what is reserved? Because before I know what is unreserved, I first need to know what is reserved. And that's when I'll be able to unpack my mind to know what is unreserved? Why is he telling me unreserved? So when I checked out, this were the... Um, the vocab words that I found, you know, uh, reserve means hold back, withhold, detain, retain, keep, refrain. If you see everything talks about holding back some parts of uh, us, if we, if we look in the context of our individual self, it's about always about holding back something, okay, or withholding some information or, or uh, refraining from certain activities that is reserved. And like what Chitrani said, you reserve a place also. That means this has been reserved for somebody or this has been reserved for some other purpose that it is not, we are not able to touch or enjoy that privilege for the moment. So this is what reserve means all about. And then if we move on, what is unreserved, which Claire had already explained just now. So when I looked at what is unreserved then, for unreserved, there were so many workout words, you know, 
And if you see there's unlimited, there's thorough, there's unconditional, there's undivided, unqualified, and you can go on with the whole list, even wholeheartedness is there. So when I looked at unreserved, when, when at the start of this year, uh, I, I mean, uh, specifically the last week of December, uh, uh, this, this term of unreserved yieldedness was something that the Holy Spirit dropped into me uh, while I was in the kitchen cooking. Okay. Um, so it has been uh, quite a number of times I have seen um, uh, it, the Lord actually speaks. Um, of course, he speaks when you're having your own personal space with him. But there are also times when he also uh, drops nuggets of his uh, information, even while you're in the course of the day. So uh, to me, it has been interesting. There have been times that he has spoken while actually I've been cooking or doing my household chores. You know, it, it has been an ongoing process. So when he dropped this word, uh, unreserved yieldedness, it actually intrigued my mind because I, I know what is yieldedness. We need to yield to the Lord. But uh, when he dropped this word, unreserved yieldedness, I realized there was an emphasis on the word unreserved. Meaning to say, it is not just yieldedness, but it has to be unreserved. That means it's absolute and, and it needs to be unconditional. We have, we have heard about unconditional love. Okay? If, if I coin now unreserved yieldedness, it can also mean as unconditional yieldedness. Okay? And so that is the meaning for unre, um, unreserved. And now what is yieldedness? Okay, for yieldedness, if you can see, uh, you'll be able to look up the dictionary and you'll be able to come across all these words, uh, inclusive of Greek, and, and, and it explains to you it is surrender, it is about submitting, it is about uh, handing over, and then it also talks about uh, to give up as something that is claimed or demanded. That means you hold nothing to yourself. Okay, this is yieldedness. And um, very quickly, just to browse through, um, when we talk about unreserved yieldedness, there is uh, two characteristics that comes to our mind very quickly. Uh, is there anyone who can share, anyone from the Bible, when you talk about unreserved yieldedness, who comes to your mind? I, I just give a moment, it can be anybody. I'm thinking David. Uh, please introduce yourself before you share Sorry. so that, you know, we will. Okay, I'm Ruth from Singapore. Yeah. Uh, she's my pastor's wife. I always call her my pastor's oh. wife. Okay. Yeah. I think King David. Yeah, sorry? King David. King David. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Thank you, Sister Kala. Anyone else? This is Ruth from Australia. I think of Hannah. I can't hear. Uh, did someone say something? Oh. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yes. Okay. This is Ruth from Australia. Um, when I think of unreserved yieldedness, I think of Hannah. Um, okay. Who gave her son Samuel. Sorry, Anne? Oh, Hannah, who gave her son uh -huh. Samuel to the Lord. Okay, Samuel. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more person. Anyone else? Uh, Glenn, maybe you want to share? Who do you think? Glenn. <coughs> Sorry, your question, dear. Yeah. Who comes to your mind um, when you talk about, when we think about unreserved yieldedness? Any biblical character? I can say Hannah, even, even Esther, and a few other people, but I can't remember now. No worries, no worries. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, she's Glenn's uh, from, uh, Glenn is from um, Australia. Australia. Sorry, yeah, so I didn't talk it. Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now I will continue to share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks uh, for all the names that you gave. For today's context, we are going to look at uh, two women okay, about unreserved yieldedness. And um, this is about Esther. So before we go into Esther, uh, we just want to understand the context about the times of Esther. 
And um, when we look at Esther's time, Esther was brought up in a very restricted period, I would say. That means the laws and the rules are very strictly uh, embedded into the society and in the community. And if you uh, bypass any of them, you are definitely put to death. Okay? And it was a period where, if, if you understand this is years and years ago, and uh, being a Jew, Esther was in a place that is non-Jewish, but she had to grow keeping a faith at all times. Um, and as she was growing under the care of Mordecai, uh, something happened in her life. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to manage uh, the air. The air ten you know, people coming in and uh, yeah and and uh, just um, mute your audios just in case uh, for those who just came in you can keep your videos on but just uh, remember to you know off your audios thank you okay so in the times of Esther when we look at it the background of Esther was she was a Jew she grew up under the guardianship of Mordecai but she was not able to tell people of her faith but despite not being able to converse to people about her faith, Esther always kept her heart right before the Lord. There was no turning back for her, even when she went into um, the king's palace. Because scripture says when she entered into the palace, she found favor. She found favor with all those who were there not only with the man that was taking care of her, and, and the, the, the man who was in charge of the entire harem, but she found favor with, even with the king in the later part of her life. So just to understand about Esther, Esther, if we follow, in Esther 4.16, Esther will say that, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Tushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days. Night or day, my mates and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Now, for Esther to come to this point, if I perish, I perish, even if it is against the law. If we really look back at Esther's life, she grew up as a Jewish girl. She was faithful. In her heart, she kept her heart right before the Lord. Although the word of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, we all knew that she kept her heart right before God, even as she was growing up under the care of Mordecai. But when she was in the palace, if we reflect back in uh, Esther 4, 14, she will, when Mordecai actually approaches her to say about the state of what is going to happen to the Jews, Esther will actually hesitate to go and speak to the king. And her reasons are valid. She said that the king has not asked for me over the past days. So me going before the king, it will mean danger. That means it will cost my life. Now, Esther's reasons are very valid. Just like for you and for me, there are times when the Lord wants us to engage in something or do something or even it would be something just obey him in a, in a simple form of obedience. It can be the most smallest thing. And our reasons might all be very valid. But before his presence, the validity of our reasons become invalid. Now, it's not that God does not understand what are the reasons. It's not, he does not understand the limitations we have, and it's not, he does not understand what we can and what we cannot do. Now, I'm sure the Lord knew very well that Esther has not been called by the king for the past number of days. The Lord knows it so well because he knows the entire universe. He knows each one of us in and out. He is the author and creator of our lives and even of this world and every happenings. So for such a sovereign God, he definitely knows about Esther's valid reasons. However, 
why I put it however is God knows everything. And despite knowing everything, when he asks us something of us, or there is something that is being placed in our hands, something that we are accountable before him. Now what happens is all, all that valid reasons, they fall off before his presence. Okay, and um, <coughs> just like how Esther had to pay a price, I believe each one of us in our own lives, we would have come to certain crossroads. There would be something you know in your heart that this is what I need to do, I need to say, I need to venture into. You know it so crystal clear. However, your situation may present to you valid reasons that you are unable to proceed with whatever the Lord has told to you. Years ago, um, for those who are close to me, who have known me uh, over the years, you would have known uh, about the two books that the Lord led me to write. Um, one of it, when I started, was uh, about Within the Veil, which was a very delayed book uh, after about 17, 18 years. Now, in that book and in my subsequent book, I had written about my experience with the Lord uh, once um, in a mountainous area. Now, in that um, vision, or I would say it's an experience that I had, the Lord specifically wanted me to do an action, okay? He specifically wanted me to obey him, that is to go to Australia, okay? That was years ago. But my reasons for not wanting to take that step was very valid. I would, in my context, I would say extremely valid, okay? I had all my grounds. I had all my evidences to debate my cause with him. And I can, I can be so certain that I'm right when I say it is not possible, Lord. It was so valid, extremely valid. However, there was a condition that I failed to obey at that time in the midst of my valid reasons. And that is obeying God. You see, there can be 101 valid reasons we can have in our grounds as um, women who love the Lord. However, when the Lord says something, it is a must. And if you look at Esther, when she said, I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish, she knew what she was heading towards. She knew that she will die if the king's favor is not cast upon her. She knew that it's against the law. She knew all of this, but she decided to go. And before going, there's one thing Esther asked that tells me when I'm studying about her that she is a woman who believes in prayer. Gather all the Jews who are present, uh, five, neither eat nor drink for three days, day and night. She asks us for all the Jews to fast for her, and she and her mates will do the same. So, when we talk about fasting in our Christian context, fasting means fast and pray. She did not ask them to starve. There's a difference. Many a times when we want to fast, I always ask myself, the fasting, is it to woo the Lord or is it for myself? Now, we do not need to woo the Lord by not eating. It is more to say as when we fast, we are actually fasting 
to get ourselves aligned with what the Lord has for us. And when we fast, and when we fast, but when we do not pray sufficiently, it becomes starving. Okay? Because many a times we might think that I've already fasted for the day, so it's good. But actually, when we fast, if, if in a normal day, we are having half an hour with the Lord, for example, when we are fasting, that half an hour needs to be extended. It cannot be a normal process. Because if it is the normal process, then what's the point of fasting? You can just have your regular time with the Lord and just continue eating. Fasting is to actually equip us to, uh, can I put it like, restrain us uh, to, to control our desires for the food, for the meals, and, and to come together to before his presence with our spirit, soul, body, and mind, to put ourselves together before him. Okay. Sorry, there is some buzzing in the background. If uh, can can I just request uh, to to be muted? You can mute them. Yeah, maybe I'll go out and mute everybody. Okay, I think it's muted. Okay, thank you. Okay, so fasting. Coming back to what I was talking about, fasting actually talks about putting our hearts right before God, our spirit, soul, body, and mind all together. So that was what Esther was doing. She was asking the people to fast and inverted commas, although it's not written there, to pray. And she said that she will do likewise with her maids. Now, why did Esther, or why, what was the need for Esther to fast and ask others to fast? It was basically to prepare herself to prepare her spirit men so that a physical man will take that step before the king. Now, before we engage in something in our lives, when the Lord wants us to do something, it can be something can be as, as uh, minute as the smallest thing he requires of us, or it can be something that is so big that it uh, scares us. But whatever it is, in whichever context it is, Basically, if we need the courage and the confidence and the willpower to step into what God wants us to do, the first thing I believe is, just like Esther, we need to set aside time to pray and to fast. Now, why do I say fast and pray? It is actually to prepare ourselves. When we fast, we actually get rid of, our, uh, uh, of whatever desires we have before the presence of God. And we also come with single-mindedness. We come with single-mindedness saying, Lord, I want to seek your face. I want to do your will, but I'm struggling. I do not have sufficient faith to do what you want me to do. I can't see the big picture, Lord. So please help me. Last year, when I was uh, fasting before um, my birthday, um, it was a 21 days fast and I was um, seeking the Lord uh, as how the Holy Spirit put in my heart for the 21 days when I was uh, fasting before him. I, my, my main concern was, Lord, what is uh, the next phase of my life? And that was um, the prayer. I mean, that, that 21 days was actually set aside to seek the Lord as I was nearing my birthday. What is your next phase? And it was on the second day and on the third day thereafter was when the Holy Spirit showed me this, um, this works stream of love. And it was something that I was not prepared. It was not something that actually I even imagined. It was something I would say um, not in my, in my comfort zone. It was something that I was not very comfortable about. Uh, because um, every one of us know that uh, starting something is very easy, but sustaining it is difficult. And when you start such a work, you put yourself out there. You put yourself out there and it's not easy, you know. And I was not prepared for that. And it, it took me time to understand and digest when he deposited this stream of love works into me. 
And that was when, during that fasting, it, it helped me because I was already setting my heart before the Lord to answer the call he had. And when he gave it to me, he did not give me the picture for the next 10 years or five years or seven years. There was nothing of that. But he taught me the three pillars. What would it be and what I will need to do and how would I need to go about for this season? And if you ask me today, what is it going to be stream of love? The truth is, I do not know it completely. I only know that I need to write. I only know that I need to intercede, pray. And I only know I need to teach. Besides these three, how would it all function and evolve into only God knows? But the very st first step I needed to do was just to obey. And just like Esther, something that Esther knew was she didn't need to know what was going to happen. She didn't have a plan. All she needed was just to go before the king. If you look at verse in chapter uh, 4, in Esther, verses 4, 15, and I mean, Esther 4, verses 14, 15, and 16, you will see Esther at the start, not wanting to go before. And Mordecai, in verse 14, he will say, who might know that you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this? And that is when, immediately, in verse 17, Esther will say, she will tell to Mordecai, the following verses, that go and gather all the Jews and I will go before the king. Now here in Esther's life, we all know what happened thereafter. She will go before the king and the king will stretch his scepter and she'll find favor. But in order for Esther to find favor in the eyes of the king, Esther had to take the step of faith to walk into the kingdom. If Esther had not walked into that king, into that palace, before the king, in the midst of all the people who were there, seated in the courtroom, Esther would not have found the favor. And later in the life, you will see, in the later in the story, you will see the Jews will be redeemed the tables will overturn. What was against for the Jews will turn to be for the Jews, in favor of the Jews. And the entire Jewish community will be preserved. But for that to happen, Esther had to go before the king. So I asked myself this when I was studying Esther. If, with all the valid reasons that Esther had, because she would be put to death, there was no guarantee that the king will stretch his hand of a favor before her. There was no guarantee. Now, if Esther had chosen to be quiet, what would have happened to the Jews? This is a question that I asked myself. And as what Mordecai said, it's true. It's true that there would be someone else God will raise and the Jews will still be preserved because the Jews are very special to the Lord. We all know about it. God would have done it, but the name of Esther, the book of Esther will not be found in the Holy Scriptures today. The only reason that the book of Esther is found here is because of the sacrifice that Esther laid. She laid a life to go before the king. And in our lives, are there situations that the Lord has wanted us to do something for him, but we have always come up with reasons, valid reasons. And even if we do not do it, God will find someone else to complete his work, no doubt. But you and I would have missed the opportunity to put a smile on the face of our Jesus. Now let's look at Ruth. When we think of Ruth, what comes to your mind? Anybody? I know there are a few Ruths here. Uh, anyone wants to say what comes to your mind when you think of Ruth? Anyone? 
You can unmute yourself and uh, submission. She's very submitted. Submission. Submission. Okay, thank you, Sakala. Anyone else? Loyal. Loyal. Okay. Thank you. Tara, you have you have want to add on? She was uh, obedient. She was obedient. Okay. Lord, faithful. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So as what we have said, Ruth was obedient. She was faithful. She was loyal. And if we look at the times of Ruth, just now we looked at the times of Esther and we saw that um, how restricted the, the, the time was. It's not like in the current times that we are in. So similarly for Ruth, if we understand about Ruth, now Ruth, initially, Ruth was not a woman who actually knew the Lord. She was actually from, uh, she, she was not part of the Jewish clan, I would say. She was not from Bethlehem. But she got married to Naomi's son in the land that they were. So we looked, she was in a period that was very different from us, the current times that we are living in our different countries. The period of Ruth when she, when her husband died, she had a choice to stay behind in Moab rather than going with Naomi to Bethlehem, okay? Um, there were two daughter-in-laws for Naomi, we are aware. And Naomi will actually stop them from following her. And when we look at Naomi, Naomi used to uh, be bitter at that stage when she lost her husband. She lost everything she had and she lost her two sons. And she felt barren in her heart, in her life. She felt empty. And she, she was in a, in a moment of being complaining about what she has lost. And in that moment in time, Ruth wants to go with Naomi, accompany Naomi back to Bethlehem. And here we see in Ruth 1 verses 16 to 17, when Naomi stops her from following, discourages her and gives her all the valid reasons of why Ruth, I mean, Ruth should not follow Naomi, but must go back to her own land. Ruth's answer is this, that forever, Wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Where you die, I will die. And if anything but death parts us apart. Now, now, if we look at Ruth, if Ruth had only gone back to Moab to her family, she would have been within her own comfort zone. She would have familiarity with the people. She would be in her own parents' home. And eventually being parents, maybe they would have found for her another man to marry because she was young, she had no children, she lost her husband. And we all know that no one can love us more than our own parents. You know, even when we are much older, we are still babies to our parents. You know, those of us who have kids, I think we will understand that even though the kids grow up, they are always our little babies. And uh, for those who are children here who are young, who are not yet married, you may not understand it now until one day you become parents and then you will understand what we are talking about, okay? Because um, regardless of age, we, we are always, always dear to our parents. So Ruth had all that flexibility to go back. And if she, go, if she goes back, as what I mentioned, she would have had all this comfort Okay, and her parents were there for her. However, Ruth took a very extraordinary part, I would say. Naomi is a mother-in-law. The moment her, her husband died, she is not obligated to continue with Naomi. 
she can choose to return back to her own land. She had a choice and no one was going to blame her. But Ruth did something which we ask ourselves whether we would do it, whether I would do it. I do not know. That's the truth. Because sometimes you are more comfortable in your own land, you know. But Ruth did something and she said something. Now, saying is one thing, doing is another thing. And we know that many a times people give easy words. I will do this for you. I will do this. I will do that. They come up with everything, you and me inclusive of it. And it's beautiful because we are very good with our words. But whether we will really put it into action is another question. Similarly, when we go before the presence of God, many a times we would have said, you and I would have said, Lord, I will do anything you want me to do. Just say the word, I will do it. Sometimes I ask myself, is it with that confidence that we say that because we know he won't ask us to do anything? You know, sometimes we think that, where you are going to say anything, Lord? You know, I will always come and say the same thing, you know, maybe asking me to do the small, small things, not the big, big things. But lo and behold, if one day he suddenly drops this to say, leave everything and go to the land that I show you, or leave everything and go and start this, what I want you to do, or, or leave whatever that you're holding back and just start afresh with me in this new uh, a destiny that I, or not even a new destiny, a destiny that I have carved for you all these years, which you have been oblivious to it, you have not taken note of it, but now I want you to engage yourself in that destiny. If we say such a thing, would you and me be able to take the leap? Earlier on, I did share that Years ago, I had this experience with the Lord when the Lord actually wanted something of me and I disobeyed. Now, from that experience, I have learned one thing that is regardless of how valid the reasons can be in life for us. If the Lord distinctively tells you and me to do something, we rather just obey it. Even if we do not know why we need to obey, we do not have the full picture. We do not have the full uh, picture ahead of what is going to happen, how is it going to happen. It's okay. Sometimes we don't need to know the big picture. Sometimes we just need to know only one thing that is the heart of the Lord. Why I say that is because sometimes when the Lord gives us a real big picture, what is the point because sometimes we do not have even enough faith to look at the big picture he wants us to see so sometimes the lord only gives us in small details what we need to do for that time in 27 2016 december again i was at my brother's place and i was i had cooked and i was i was sweeping and mopping the floor okay, the kitchen floor while I was cleaning, okay, doing my household chores, the Spirit of God told me, you owe me two dues, okay? This is what he said, you owe me two dues. And while I am actually cleaning, I'm having this conversation, I said, dues, two dues, what two dues do I owe you, you know? And then he reminded me, you have not written the book about Esther, which started 17, 18 years ago. And secondly, you have not gone to Portugal yet. And both of this was actually in that time in 2016, it was about 17, about 16, 17 or 18 years ago. Okay, it was after uh, when my son was born, uh, the Lord put in my heart to write a book on Esther. And secondly, um, I had a dream about Mother Teresa bringing me to Portugal. Okay. And I knew that I needed to do this, do these things, do these two things. But over the course of the years, with many things happening in my life, I conveniently forgot about it. I forgot about it because the situation I was in and the happenings that were happening around me, what was so bizarre and it took, 
it took all my attention and strength away that I, I very conveniently forgot about these two things. It was not even at the back of my mind, to be honest. I was more busy with life, meddling with life, seeing what is life going to do to me and what am I going to do to life? It was basically, I was in that stage. So when the Holy Spirit dropped these words, you owe me two Jews, see, I was not prepared. Seriously, it was not, I was not at the right place at the right time to do what he wanted me to do. So that's something. Sometimes when the Lord asks you to do something or take heed of something, you may not be at the right place at the right time. And you might feel that this is not the season, but the Lord's seasons and calendaring works differently. And to add on to the two overdues, I was specifically instructed that I needed to finish writing the book and finish going to Portugal by end of June, 2017. Meaning to say the Holy Spirit gave me only six months and I just firstly could not understand because I didn't have the means uh, to make a trip to Portugal, nor to print a book. And secondly, I do not know what to really write. I mean, I had started on the book of Esther twice um, about 17, 18 years ago then. And then in 2012, 2013, I started. And then I, I paused it again. You know, the second pause I did. But now in 2016, December, he's giving me just six months to complete. Right. Okay. So um, at that time, as I said, I was not at the right place at the right time to do what he wanted me to do. But he just gave me six months. Okay. All I, I knew was by June 2017, I needed to finish the book and I needed to go to Portugal. So um, uh, for people who know me, they know that I am mostly homebound. I don't really go out anywhere, even don't explore my own Singapore oh, video, yeah. my own neighborhood. All I know is go to work, go to school, come back. And the only other place maybe I go to uh, is maybe church. And besides church, one or two friends and uh, that is occasionally I meet and uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I can say that I'm very comfortable just staying at home, you know, having my own cup of tea and don't like to go out. Give me a choice, I'll just stay at home. So during the COVID period, I know there are people who found it difficult not going out, but I was one person who found it perfectly fine to stay indoors for four months, you know, just only needing to go and do grocery shopping because practically that is me. I enjoy staying at home, you know. Um, so. I, since I've never explored even my own neighborhood, asking me to go to Portugal is something very bizarre. It's something that I will never do in my life. If I had a partner or a friend who's going with me, I'll have some guts. But I know, and, and to add on, I, I knew no one in Portugal, not a single soul I knew in Portugal. And I had no friends in that area of, of, of that vicinity, that country space, that even for emergency that I can call someone for help. I, I just didn't know where to start. You know, when the Lord told me you have to go to Portugal, the first question is, where in the world am I to go? Portugal is so big. Where do I choose to go? So, but I knew that I couldn't get out of it because that so-called the pressing in the heart continued till the end of January. You need to write the book. You need to go to Portugal. It was like, it, it is, how do I say it? You cannot get out of it. Even though I go to work, I come back from work, I sleep, I wake up. The pressing, you know, the, the, the knowing is you have to go, you have to go. It was so strong that I said that no matter what, I'm going to go. So what I did, um, I, of course, you know, I, I, I conveyed the message to my brother and to my kids. And of course, my brother was very concerned because knowing my make who have not even stepped out, is it? Is Portugal really going to be safe? And I had friends who were equally concerned about me. And um, one thing I knew is, I told my kids is, even if mommy don't come back, this is what I told them, you know, even if I don't come back, uh, just know that I, in my attempt to please God, you know, things happen, you know. So I was very mentally prepared that I may or may not come back. 
because you hear of horror stories, you know, people being kidnapped, people being killed, you know, overseas. And, and, you know, I am not very observant sometimes of my surrounding. I know my own self, my weakness, you know. So for me to go to a place that I don't know anybody and I don't even know what am I going to do was scary. But I, I trust, I mean, I thank God so much at that moment in time, uh, there was this seal of God that I really wanted to please him. I really wanted to do it. So long story short, I actually started my trip by identifying uh, St. Teresa's church because it was St. Teresa and my mother Teresa who brought me in that dream to Portugal. So I thought it would be only logical for me to find some spot with, you know, St. Teresa or Mother Teresa. So I found a church there. And, um, and, and, and prior to that period in 2015, 2016, the Lord put, a, a, I would say, a kind of a connection with the Jews within my heart. You know, there was, there, was, there was this burden for the Jews and this love for the Jews, this, this longing to be connected with Jews. And I know that it didn't appear in my earlier times with the Lord. It was just in that season, about 2015, 2016. And I knew that when I'm going to Portugal, that God will connect me with the Jews. But I know nothing about it. And I just felt in that dream, I, I saw a group of people and in my heart, I sensed they were the Jews. Other than that, I knew nothing. But miraculously, when I transited at Dubai Airport, uh, I met a, a Jewish, a, a Jew who is, uh, who is from Portugal. She's a Portuguese, okay? And uh, it was just at, the, at one of the shops, you know, while just standing, we just conversed. And immediately, uh, she directed me to a particular place. She said, you have to go to, since you're going to Coimbra, you need to go to this particular village. Uh, where uh, you will be connected to these Jews. But she said it is very further in and it's a very small Jewish settlement and not many people know about it, but maybe you can go there, okay? And she gave me all the contact details of her that in emergency who, that I can contact her in Portugal. And then she disappeared. Why I say she disappeared? We traveled in the same place, but when um, she alighted uh, with her husband and she went off, Thereafter, when I was in Portugal, um, I, I was desperate for help. At one point, when I tried to call her, I couldn't reach her. And I tried to email her until today, she has never responded. So I, in my heart, I just felt she was a God sent angel to actually direct me to that Jewish community. And when I was in Portugal by itself, as I said, I traveled alone and um, it was one life of an experience, and uh, I still can't um, understand how I how I had such boldness to go. And in that trip, that thing that still um, stands out is uh, God's faithfulness in my life. And I met a nun who looked um, almost like me. Put it that way. Uh, too bad I don't have the picture here. It's in my phone. Um, she she looked almost like me. And uh, till today, I still wonder whether she's my angel, you know, because again saying she gave a contact and we tried to contact her in the nunnery, but she was not there. And according to the head nun, I mean, what they said is there's no such a person with the description that I, I gave. Her name was Maria. Okay. And um, in that trip, after I finished the Portugal trip, I came back. And in, while I was in Portugal was when I finished the book and it went for print. I finished all of it in June, okay? July 1st, uh, for 10 years, I had prayed for a house. After my uh, divorce, um, I had been praying to the Lord for a house and I had tried everything, everything uh, to get an HDB house, you know, right to the, um, right into appeal, meet the ministers, do everything that I can. But the Lord gave me a promise that he will give me a house, but in the 10 years, I didn't materialize. And there were days I used to weep before the Lord because I knew that uh, my children, especially my daughter, wanted to come and stay with me. And hearing her desire to stay with me, it, it used to break my heart. And, and I used to weep before the Lord and say, Lord, just once, just a move of your finger, you will create a miracle for me. And you have so many houses 
It's not that you're short-handed. So please give me a house. Please, Lord. And the Lord promised me, and it, the, the best part was in that number of years when I used to pray, he used to give me descriptions of how the house should be, the facing of the house and all of it. And it was very comical to me is, you're not giving a house, but you're giving me all the descriptions of the house. Isn't that so odd, Lord? All you need to do is just give. The, the explanation and the details and description can come later, but just give. But the Lord was not interested to give. He was more interested to give the details. Now, when the Lord, when the Holy Spirit put in my heart to finish the two deals by June 2017, little did I know that the moment I settled these two deals on the 1st of July, he will bring me to this house that I'm staying. And from 1st of July, the moment I stepped into this house and he told me, this is the house that you'll be buying. He brought me through the next six months that on the 15th of December, I moved into the house that I'm staying. It just took him five and a half months. And in that five and a half months, the house was seen, was bought, it, the, the contract was sealed and endorsed. The house was, uh, whatever that needs to be renovated was renovated. The furnitures were, were, were bought. Everything that was needed was done for the house. That we'll be able to move in on the 15th. Until today, I ask myself, in five and a half months, so much happened. But for that miracle of this 10 years wait for the house to materialize, I needed to do two things. It was not that the Lord demanded of me, but the Lord had put it in my heart to obey him. Just two things. And when I look at this scripture of Ruth, it says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And where you die, I will die. When I went to Portugal, I was not following any Nahomi but I was following the Lord, and that was exactly how I felt. How I felt, I was prepared that anything can happen to me there, not that I didn't have faith. I had faith the Lord will take care of me, but at the other side, I had my kids, and I was accountable towards my kids. So I told my kids, even if anything happens, just know something happened to me while I was attempting to please the Lord. I was mentally prepared. But I was not mentally prepared for the blessing that he was going to give to me when I returned. So in our lives, sisters, there might be times that the Lord will actually want something of us. Is there any dues in our life that we had? We are still pending that only you and I can answer. Only you and I can answer before the Lord. In all our lives, in our walks, there might be something the Lord would have asked us years ago. There would be something the Lord would have just put across in our hearts. It can be the smallest thing. Maybe go and share to this person about the scripture, or maybe do this thing for this person. Uh, it could be write something, write a song, compose the music, or be creative, come up with a script for a musical drama, it can be anything. Or take part in uh, organizing a, an event for, for children. Uh, it could be anything. Or it could be a donation drive. And it can be anything and everything, I would say. But if it is something the Lord has put in our hearts, we may not have the big answers. When I went to Portugal, I had no answers. It was my first solo trip in my life okay. and it's a trip that will always stay very close to me because in that trip it was literally the lord and me i knew nobody there i was clueless and even if something happens to me nobody will know but the lord was my refuge he was my stay and when i came back he presented me with an unbelievable gift in that year, March 2017, the Lord told me that the house that he gives to me will be a inheritance from him. 
And when he said he will give me as an inheritance, I only smiled to myself because for the past number of years, Lord, you have been giving me promises about the house, but I have not seen it yet. But in 2017, the Lord amazed me by giving me this house. But for that miracle to come by in my life, I firstly had to obey. And for Ruth, for her Boaz to come into her life, for her to be placed in the lineage of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, she had to obey, or rather can I say, she had to forego a comfort zone. She had to forego a familiarity. She had to forego a connections, a familiar connections and go into a land where she might not even be well accepted or even well respected. But she decided to follow Naomi. And by doing that, we all know that scripture says that Ruth not only found a Boaz, a love, she was comforted, she was taken care of, she was loved, she was accepted, and she found a place in the Holy Bible, a book just for herself, the book of Ruth. It is a small, tiny book, but in that small, tiny book, you see a woman's faithfulness. You see a woman's commitment. You see a woman's single-heartedness. But in order for all those miracles that Ruth experienced, for her to experience that, the first thing she had to do is she had to go. She had to go where Naomi was. So when we look at Esther and Ruth, both of them tell us only one thing. Both of them were selfless. Both of them were single-minded. And both of them were determined. Esther went before the king selflessly. She had only one single-minded focus. That is, she had to go in to save the Jews. And she was determined, even if I perish, I perish, but I will go ahead. And similarly for Ruth, she was selfless. When she decided to go follow after Naomi, she only had one single-minded focus. That is Naomi. She need to take care of Naomi. She has to be there for her. And, and Ruth that no ulterior agenda. Her only agenda was Naomi was old. She has no husband, no children, no family. She had nothing. She's returning back. She's a old woman. I need to be there as a daughter-in-law to take care of her. That was all she had in her mind, single-minded. And she was determined. Why do I say determined? Is because the scripture says that Naomi will try to discourage Ruth from following her. She will even throw her a riddle by saying, do you think I have children to give you to marry? And even if I do, it will not be happening. But regardless of the persuasive persuasion by Naomi, valid reasons. Again, I come there. Naomi presented valid reasons, the most valid reasons to Ruth so that Ruth will change her mind from following after Naomi. But again, Ruth pursued selflessly with single-mindedness and determination to follow after Naomi. So in both Esther's and Ruth's life, we can learn today, there are three things that we can learn. They were selfless, they were single-minded, they were determined. And what happened? Esther brought salvation, I would say, for the Jews. Why do I say salvation? She helped to preserve the community and she brought hope and restoration. And for Ruth, we all know the story that because of a selfless, single-minded and determined act, she found acceptance in the land of the Lord. She found acceptance in the lineage of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Such a, a, a joyous moment she would have had when she got to know it much later. So even as we end, I want to end with this question. When we talk about unreserved yieldedness, we started off by unpackaging what is being reserved, 
what is being unreserved and what is yieldedness. And then we moved on to learn about Esther, her times, and how she single-mindedly determined to go before the king. If I perish, I perish. And how we move into Ruth's life in Ruth's times and how Ruth determined herself, wherever you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Both of them found their own miracles. They answered the call of their destiny. Now, sisters, you and I have a destiny in our life. It may not be as fabulous as what you see in some people's life. It can be behind closed doors. It might be something between the Lord and you. But it is a destiny the Lord has deposited into our lives. Some of us may be called to serve. Some of us may be called to teach. Some of us may be called to play music, to compose songs. Some of us may be blessed with creative skills to, to create you know, our creative dramas. Or, or some of us may be just be destined to be found at his feet, just to have a relationship of intercession before him and us. Or for some, it might be to travel and, and to share the word, or for some to just teach children, or some is just to go and show love to those on the streets who are, who are hopeless. It can be anything, but each of us have a destiny in our lives. And the question that I want to leave with you is, do we have unreserved yieldedness today before him to answer the destiny? The destiny part is B. The A is the unreserved yieldedness. When we have unreserved yieldedness, God amazes us and surprises us. But until we come to that point of unreserved yieldedness, the Lord will continue to brew his works in our hearts because he's most interested is about our yieldedness to him. And it cannot be half-baked yieldedness. It cannot be, I give you 75%, Lord, I keep 25%. In my heart, there are 10 rooms. I give you nine and a half rooms. But the half room I will keep, Lord, is my private space. You know, we all talk about me time. We all talk about private space and time and we enjoy it, you know. But with the Lord, I regret to say that you and I, we do not have our private space and time away from him. Our private space and time is with him. And in our hearts, in the 10 rooms, all 10 rooms belong to him. And in our 100%, 100% belongs to him. And that speaks of unreserved yieldedness. So whenever you and I face a situation in our life where we need to make a decision, let's always reply back on Esther, on Ruth, and see how they responded and what was following thereafter. Because of their response, what was yielded to them, what was given unto them, and how they fulfilled their destiny. So I just want to end on this note that, as I said, it's, it's more of a teaching of, of understanding about what is unreserved yieldedness. And even in the course of the week, you know, when you have time, you can take time to, you know, study yourself or even pray, you know, is there anything in your life that is still being reserved? And if it is, it is between you and the Lord. And um, we take time to heal ourselves and come under his hand to understand what is unreserved yieldedness? What, how can we yield unreservingly unto him? Thank you and let's pray.